um, I mean, silver, I think, is is particularly interesting because it is um, the best conductor known to man, electrical conductor known to man. And so with um, the, um, you know, environmental thing, um, ESG, environment, social governance and all the rest of it, um, uh, you know, Everything is is being moved away from fossil fuels. Uh, it's being moved towards electricity, towards battery power, towards nuclear, uh, lithium. Now, if you look last year, what happened to the price of uh, of lithium? It increased roughly five hundred percent, I think, <clears throat> four or five hundred percent. Problem with lithium is that um, you don't really have um, a futures market um, so that you and I can go and buy contracts in it and all the rest of it. All you can do is buy share, you know, shares in a lithium minor if you like um and of course the other thing uranium i mean that almost doubled so why did silver halve i mean it just not not half sorry it it it, it was down from i think it's it, it was up at what 30 dollars at one stage and it's currently around about 22 i mean it is completely nonsensical and uh, there is no doubt that um because uh, the system if i can put it that way is short to speculators which is really what um, uh, uh, um, derivatives are all about, um, it has not been in their interest to let the price run away. It, it's as simple as that. Um, so I think what the story could be for silver uh, next year is that there's a monetary story, which you know we've, we've touched on and probably will discuss a little bit more, uh, but there is also the industrial use story. So it is just completely mispriced. Um, I can't see that there is the mine production to satisfy the potential industrial demand for silver, let alone the combination of industrial demand as is uh, and and uh, investment demand on top. Um, I mean, we're talking about something like um, a billion ounces a year, if you like, of silver, which is mined or, um, you know, recovered from scrap. This, this you know, it, it's not huge um and it doesn't take a huge amount of money to shift it um as various people in the past have tried to do um i think one of the things that worked badly for silver was uh this robin hood you know thing i mean sort of very silver bulls who you and i will know uh you know sort of try to encourage uh the small punter to you know buy a contract or go and buy um slv or one of the other etfs silver etfs um, uh, in order to create a shortage in the market. And that created a spike up to 30. But what it did, unfortunately, is it had introduced an awful lot of weak holders. And so the price has been suffering ever since because, you know, when it backed off from 30, um, you know, these people who didn't really know what was happening, um, other than, uh, you know, this seemed like a good idea at the time, um, they got no other reason really to hold silver. Um, that provided the sentiment background, I think. So that's not been helpful. Now, to, to turn to uh, Basel III, it, we're particularly looking at um, the uh, net stable funding ratio, which which is um, a new regulation which has now been introduced into America, into Europe, and as of the beginning of this month, into the UK. And uh, what it does is it penalizes uh, banks in terms of the, the funding of the assets of their balance sheet um, if they use them to have derivatives. It also, incidentally, penalizes them for various other things. So it's not we're not just talking gold and silver. We're not just talking wider derivatives. We're not just talking um, uh, running bull positions or bear positions in stocks. Um, we are not just talking about, um, you know, what's the difference between small depositors and large depositors, because there is a difference in terms of how you fund your balance sheet with, the, with those two categories alone. So this is um, a far wider situation than just the area in which you and I and our various followers are, are interested in. It is not um, a regulatory requirement for a bank to um, have, uh, you know, let's say, you know, uh, one approach, one strategy, one business strategy as opposed to another. All we're talking about is how it is funded. So if a bank wants to run an uneven, une uneven book, whether it's in derivatives or gold, silver, whatever, then basically 
that bank is going to have a cost hurdle to overcome. And it's the cost of funding it from the other side. It will restrict what the bank can do in other areas. Now, that is already in place. But what it does not do, and this is where the confusion lies, I think, is it does not force a bank suddenly to say, oh, the regulator says we can't have an open position in gold or silver in derivatives, so we're going to close it down. It does not do that. And I think it's very important to get that point over. What it will do, I think, in the long term, however, is that um, I think that a bank which values its reputation with the regulator might try and become cleaner in terms of its approach under the net stable funding ratio than it is at the moment. So what I would see over a period of time is banks being less involved, if you like, in the wider derivative world than they are today. But this is not something they're going to do overnight. I mean, we're looking at something that is going to take some time if indeed uh, it happens, because from a bank's point of view, I mean, basically what the Treasury Department of the bank will do is it will turn around to the traders, say, on the gold desk and say, right, we're raising the hurdle here because it, uh, because of our cost of funding. So instead of you uh, us expecting you to make 10 percent per annum on you know, the, the, the capital that we allocate, we now expect you to make 15. <laughs> if you don't like it, go away. So, you know, so I think that's what's going to happen. I, it's not suddenly new rules in place. Everybody's got to comply. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn 500,000, 1 million dollar, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke. And you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where do you start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof. To the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.